Good morning, everybody. I also want to welcome everybody who's live streaming and a part of this Mosaic community. So good morning to you. Okay, I see that look on your faces. I see it. You are, you're surprised to see me up here. Well, I'm just a surprise to be standing up here. So we're all in the same boat. Where I've been sitting is where you are right now for almost a decade. I've been a part of Mosaic. I came in the very beginning of it. And so my comfort is sitting right there. Um, and listening to Naeem, and so, but while I've been sitting still, I've wanted to say a few things. <laughs> I've been biting my tongue, which is called self-control, and that's a new thing for me, and so now that I have the stage and this fancy mic, i got to say something, but we got to agree to not tell Naeem. Can we all agree to be, keep this on the DL? Can we just signify, raise your hand a little bit, that secrets are healthy? Can we? All right. All right, good. <laughs> From your pastor, anyway, right. So here's what i got to say. Naeem Fazel is an exceptional pastor and godly man. He comes up here, that's right. He comes on this stage or some stage every week and shares the same message that God is love and that when you live in that love, you have purpose and life goes beyond your imagination. And he does it in creative, diverse ways. Ways that keep me hungry and thirsty to keep coming back and learn more about the Word. He does an exceptional job. And not only that, all the pastoral staff here at Mosaic is so authentic and just amazing. So can we give all of them a round of applause? I'm so grateful to be under their spiritual, their spiritual guidance. And when Naeem's not here, he's usually on some other stage sharing the gospel. And I don't know if you know this, but people in other places stand in line for an, over an hour just to meet him, shake his hand, get his autograph. And that same man that people are willing to stand in line for is available to us in the Mosaic community every day. So I'm so grateful for that. In his absence, he's asked me to come and share a message. And this is not my normal capacity. What I do for a living is I'm a psychotherapist. I'm also the co-founder of a ministry called ICU Talks. We are a woohoo. Love you, girl. Money later. Money later. <laughs> we are a speaking ministry um, that meets right here the third Tuesday of every month. And so happy to be a part of that and being a church that embraces mental health and spiritual health being one. Uh, but normally, I'm a psychotherapist, which means I spend a large bulk of my day. People come to see me one-on-one, -on -one, and they talk to me. And I act like I'm listening. <laughs> and they pay me. So those of you who come see me and pay for my outfit today, thank you. Thank you. Continue to pay for my car payment. I appreciate that. That is definitely not the car you're paying for. <laughs> That's two or three sessions we would wrap it up, but you've got to pay for something a little bit nicer than that, so, so thank you for that. So I also want to share with you how I even came to this church. You ever gone to a church and just struggled to feel a part of, struggled to, to belong? You ever had that experience? The church I went to prior to this, I went a couple of times, it was Bible-based, and I was learning. So I went up to the lead pastor, and I said, sir, I... I would like to meet with you and talk about this being my home church. And he said, I, I don't meet with the congregants. I said, okay. And I walked away. And then he found out that I know people of influence. So he called me back. And he said, he's ready to meet with me. So I met with him and I said, sir, this is a great church. I'm learning a lot. I would like to get involved. And he said, we're not a connecting church. Or an equipping church. We'll watch you. And if we think you're worthy of getting involved, we'll let you know. And then he said, then he looked at me and he said, you're an attractive woman. I bet you don't hear that a lot. And I said, no, sir. And I mumbled on my breath and I still haven't. <laughs> so then for three years I was in this church and God made it clear to stay at that church. And I didn't know why. And there's multiple reasons. And one of those is God was waiting for Naeem and Ashley to get off their tushes and start <laughs> Mosaic. 
And so once that happened, God, again, made it so clear that I was to come to this church. And so I did. And I went up to Naeem. I did the same thing. I said, sir, this is before I knew to not respect him. I said, I, said, I said, sir, I would like to meet with you and possibly make this my home church. He said, absolutely, as soon as possible. So we met. And before he knew my story, before he knew the hell that I came from or how much I believed or what I believed at all, he said, come to prayer group this Saturday. He didn't ask if I knew people of influence. He didn't ask about my income or if I was going to give 10% to this church. All he cared about was the one who has true influence, our Heavenly Father. And he wanted me to come and learn more about him. See, Mosaic is a connecting church. You belong before you believe. All you have to have is a little curiosity about Jesus. And you've earned your seat. You don't have to do anything to be worthy to be involved. So grateful to be a part of that and to, be to finally tell you that I get to be a part of something so much greater because the doors are open here. So Naeem's asked me to share my story, and I'm going to do that. I want to pray for you first. I've been in prayer for you for a while. I want to pray over you. And after I pray, I'm going to say my name is Kim and that I am an alcoholic. I'm going to ask at that time that you say, hi, Kim. Can you do that? All right, let's bow our heads. Father God, I thank you that you appointed this time. Every person here, Lord, you've asked them to be here. You have a message for them, Father. Help us to learn how to make our past our past, to get out of shame and instead go in to your love, Father. Craft every message, every little word that comes out, Lord, so that it goes right in the hearts of the people who need to hear it, Father. Please get me out of the way. I'm simply the vessel. We move me and move in and help us to get closer and more intimate with you today. It's in your son's name, the name of Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. My name is Kim, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Thank you. I'll tell you what you just did for me. I just told you the most shameful thing about me, something I hid from and did not want to acknowledge for so many years. I just told you my truth, and you said, Hi, Kim. You included me. See, in my drinking, I was in and out of treatment centers, in doctor's offices, and therapist's offices, and they always told me something more was wrong with me. They always told me what condition that I suffered from and gave me many diagnoses. I was told that I'm bipolar, post-traumatic stress disorder, anorexic, bulimic, drug addict, alcoholic, self-mutilator, oppositional defiant disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and I could increase that list. I just kept hearing that something was wrong with me. And underneath all those diagnoses was rejection. I'm sure that every person here has been rejected and none of us want to go through it again. And underneath all that was shame. I mean, just thinking that I was unworthy, something was so inherently wrong with me. My rejection started in my family. I want to tell you a little bit about my family, and I obviously don't have time today to give you the intricate, beautiful details of my story of what God did for me. I want to give you the cliff notes today. My dad is my absolute favorite person. I love my daddy. My dad's an attorney. If you're going to be a drunk, have an attorney as a dad or a mom. Works out pretty well. And uh, he's an attorney in the legal community. His name is Gentle Jim. Now, we all know attorneys. The adjective gentle doesn't come to mind. He's just an exceptional man, just a very different man. And then over here we have my mother. My mother is from Panama. She's full-blood Hispanic. I'm half Hispanic. Very proud of that. A mother has dark, dark skin, dark eyes, dark hair, stunningly beautiful. But she never knew how to connect to me. She knew how to reject me. When your first bond is pain, you learn that pain is bond. She told me on a regular basis how fat I was. I wasn't good enough. She hid from me. She verbally abused me. She hit me. And I could go on and on with details. She just didn't know how to love me. And the only thing my little brain as a little girl could conceptualize, the only thing I could come up with of why she rejected me was because of how I looked. Because I don't look like her. I don't look like anybody. So I didn't know how to connect to her. She didn't know how to connect to me. 
I didn't know what to do with that pain. But I found a solution at the age of 11. At the age of 11, I got incredibly intoxicated. So drunk that I had a blackout, which means that you can walk and talk and interact with people, but you have no memory because of the amount of alcohol on your brain. I came to, and there was a trail of vomit from my bed to my bathroom. And I was in the bathroom. My mother was in there as well, yelling at me. You see, she always yelled at me. She always told me I wasn't good enough. This time, this time it didn't matter. This time her words didn't hurt. For a moment, my shame was covered by alcohol. So I became a daily drinker at that point. My drinking and drugging escalated and progressed very quickly. At the age of 13, I got caught with drugs at school. I got suspended for 10 days, and I was sent to my first outpatient treatment center. Age of 15, I finished my ninth grade year. Where I'm from, I'm from Fort Mill, South Carolina. Whenever you finish a school year, you go to the beach. So I went to the beach. I remember very little of it. I came to in a hospital bed, an ICU. On the left-hand side of my bed was my father, my favorite person. On the right-hand side was a priest and two nuns. And I looked at my father. I said, what are they doing? Because I had no memory. I had no idea how I ended up there. And my dad, I had no idea what my dad had even gone through. But see, it turns out that I had sat on a two-story building drunk. And I'd fallen off and landed directly on my skull. And doctors had come to my father and had told him, your little girl probably won't live. And if she does, she'll be paralyzed because I had a blood clot in my brain. I didn't know any of that. And I said, what are they doing? And my dad said, they're reading you your last rites. They are praying for you to live. See, I didn't know the one other person that was by my bed was my Heavenly Father. See, I didn't know him then, but he knew me. And in time, I got better, and I walked out of that hospital with staples in my head. And the blood clot had dissipated, so I had partial paralysis in my face. It's not very detectable. But I was able to walk out of that hospital. But the one person who was not by my bed was my mother. My mom came to the hospital on the seventh day that I was there. She just didn't know how to love me. But I knew she wasn't there. So I continued doing the only thing I knew to do. I drank. At the age of 17, I was placed in the inpatient treatment center. Part of the reason, honestly, I agreed to go was I'd been given a brand new car, and I knew I'd get drunk and total it. So I went to this treatment center. After being there for a couple of weeks, they called in outside psychiatrists to come meet with me and run tests. And as a result of those tests, the staff came and said that I had to leave, that I was too mentally ill to be there. <laughs> now listen, we all know active alcoholics. There is not one active alcoholic that's stable. I'm not really sure what signs and symptoms I exhibited that they needed me to leave immediately. <laughs> but that's what happened. And so I left. And again, it's just more rejection. It's more shame. At the age of 17, I came to again in a hospital bed. My father on the left-hand side of my bed. On the right-hand side of my bed was a high patrol trooper. It is better, my friends, to look and see a priest <laughs> by your hospital bed than to see a police officer. That car that I had concern about, I had gotten drunk and totaled it. So standing right there, the police officer, while I was in my hospital bed, arrested me on two alcohol-related charges. But I kept drinking. It's all I knew to do. Age 18, I had an absolute privilege, a, a, a beautiful God gift, and I was accepted to Columbia College. It's a fantastic undergraduate school. And I was there for about a month, and I called home. My mom answered the phone. I said, hi, Mom. My mom said, nobody here wants to talk to you. There is no point in you calling home. So I hung up, and you know what I did? 
the only thing I knew to do, I continued to drink. I graduated from college, my drinking continued. I got a good job, my drinking continued. And then I came to again in a hospital bed. I hadn't had food in my system in three weeks. I looked around and I knew where I was. It wasn't my first time someone had taken me to Mercy Hospital, the medical detoxification unit. I looked to my left and this time there was no one there. My dad wasn't there. I looked to my right and there was no one there. There was no one by my hospital bed this time. But that day on April 8, 1995, I realized for the first time my Heavenly Father was standing there. And I sincerely called out to him and I said, God, help me. And my life has never been the same. I was able to physically detox and I got clean and sober. But in order for me to really get clean, I had to figure out how to clean up the mess from my past. So I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and they helped me work the 12 steps. And the 12 steps helped you look at the wreckage of your past. They taught me how to be current, that I couldn't be current and live a life without looking what I've been running from for so long. And I started going to church. So the first time in my life, I was going to church. I was learning scripture. Scripture's like James 3.30 that says, I must decrease so that God can increase. Can, de- can increase. I had to learn what I had to decrease. I had to get rid of the regret, the shame, the rejection. I had to clean myself of all of that if God was going to be resurrected inside of me and I was going to live a godly life. So I started having to learn. I had to learn what shame is. Shame is a lie. Shame is believing that something is so wrong with me that I don't deserve God's love. I haven't met anyone yet who doesn't struggle with shame, and that's because it all started in the Garden of Eden. We all know the story of Genesis. The Eve was in the garden, and the serpent, the enemy, came in and started lying to her, telling her she needed more, she needed to be more, that who she was wasn't good enough. And when your belief system gets affected, then your thoughts get affected, and you start thinking that you're not enough. And from that comes behavior, and her behavior is that she ate from the tree. And the minute she did that, she was separate from God's love. See, shame is so powerful that the part of you, the core of you that knows that you can change, the part of you that knows you deserve God's love gets covered up. Shame covers it. The good news for us is that the blood of the Lamb covers all of it. But we have to know how shame comes into our lives, what it looks like if we're going to defeat it. There's always an event that comes in with shame. It might be being bullied at school. It might be being part of divorce. It might be being rejected by your own mother. It could be as horrific as molestation or loss of a child. But there's always an event, there's a traumatic event that tethers us to our shame. My best way of explaining this to you all is to use a metaphor. And I just want to explain, again, this is just a metaphor, but I want you to imagine for a second that I'm a little girl and I'm in my room. And my room is pristine, it's immaculate, it's perfect. My little Sean Cassidy posters on the wall <laughs> look great. My little Hello Kitty pillows are all fluffed up. And all of a sudden, a man, a stranger, came, comes into my room and he destroys my room. He, he, he knocks over all the clothes. He turns my furniture upside down. He makes a big mess in my room. He writes graffiti on the wall. And there was a mess. There was this whole mess in my room that I didn't cause. And then he leaves. And I'm left in the pain. I'm left in the mess. What I've learned as a psychotherapist is that people cover shame in one or two ways. Either they try to be perfect or they're rebellious. People that are perfect, they see this mess, they see all of this, and they take all of it and they shove it in the closet and they shut the door. Or they put it in a drawer so nobody will ever see it. And they spend the rest of their lives trying to look perfectly, act perfectly, speak perfectly. Say yes to every request that's given to them because they don't want anyone to know there's a mess in their lives. See, I don't struggle with that. 
I'm a rebel. So I stood in that mess and I waited for, for him to come back, and he didn't. I waited for somebody, anybody, to notice that I was in pain and I had been hurt, and, and no one did. So I did what rebels do, and I added to the mess. See, again, my initial bond was painful, and I believed that pain was a bond. So my relationship with men, relationship with food, relationship with alcohol was all about pain. And so I made the mess so big and made it so much worse that I forgot I was not the original person that even caused that mess. So now I'm clean and sober. If I'm going to be clean, I have to clean the mess. People started supporting me and helping me to clean up all this mess that's been caused in my life. And from cleaning that and getting the debris out of the way, clean up the wreckage of my past, I could be current, and that started giving me clarity. And from that, I learned about God, and I learned that I am chosen. I learned that God chose me. We're taught in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, that, but you are chosen by God chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instrument to do his work, to speak out for him, tell others of the night and day difference he made from you. He took you from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. When we started this talk today, I told you that my name was Kim, and I was an alcoholic, I told you all the conditions been placed on me in life. Now I want to do that again. I want to tell you my name and my true condition, and I want you to say, hi, Kim. My name is Kim, and I am chosen. I am chosen. You are chosen. You are chosen. We are all chosen by God. It doesn't matter how much rejection has been in our lives. That your own mother and father can reject you, but the creator of the whole world in six days chose you. That truth is stronger than shame will ever be. As I started to clean up this mess and learn who I was in him, I already knew who I was in shame. I had to learn who am I in him it started with somebody had to see my mess. So I suggest that for you, that you decide who's safe. I can go tell my story to anybody now. I don't have to have a safe person. But it started with a safe person. That you find somebody, whether it's a professional, whether it's your spouse or best friend, someone's got to see your mess. So many of us hide behind our mess because if you met me back then, you didn't see Kim, you saw my behavior. And other people have got to stop hiding that there is a mess. Someone needs to know about that. When I came to Mosaic, I'd been sober for 10 years. But I still had not been baptized because I couldn't feel safe enough. And honestly, the idea of looking like I just got out of the shower in front of a bunch of strangers <laughs> was a little too vulnerable for me and, and tethered me back to my trauma and my own shame in my life. When I came to Mosaic, there was something different here. I got connected. And it was time. It was time to be baptized. And I'm actually the first person ever baptized at Mosaic. Thank you. And back then, we did it at a friend's house at Peninsula. So I got baptized in rich people water. So if you notice a gold tent, that is why. But somebody has to see your mess. Otherwise, you think you are the mess. You're not. You're God's son. You're God's daughter. We're taught in Philippians 3, 13 through 15. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. See, if I'm going to forget the past, and not have it bleed into my life today, I have to face it. I can't act like it's not affecting me. But I didn't change what happened to me in my past. I changed it how it affected me. And once I did that, I could go out and impact other people what I've been through. See, not looking at your past is like just reading the Old Testament. It's good. It's God's word. 
but something feels incomplete. The New Testament brings in a new covenant. It's a new relationship. It's the whole story. If you want to know your whole story, your purpose, your calling in this world, you got to look at the whole story. You got to look at the whole picture. Let's continue with this. I need to press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. That I have to stay in the race. That I'm not looking at my past means I'm, I'm getting halfway through a 5K and I'm stopping. You can keep going. We have to find safe people to show your mess to. Stop hiding behind what's been done to you or what you've done to somebody else. It's time. It's time to press on and stay in the race. Again, there is a calling to all of our lives. We are all chosen. Chosen. That we don't have to be defined by what was done to us. We can be defined by what God did for us. To remember that the tomb is empty. That he is risen. And let him rise up in you. So my question to all of you today is that are you ready? Are you ready to say no more? No more comparing yourself to somebody else. No more to listen to that voice of that coach when you were a kid or that parent on the sideline or that friend who rejected you starting in sixth grade. No more listening to that voice. Are you ready when the voice in your head tells you that you're not good enough to tell it to be quiet, that you're chosen? Are you ready to be who God's called you to be and not who shame is trying to convince you you are? It's time to rise up. There's nothing that any of us have gone through that's bigger than God's love for you. So are you ready? It's the day to day. There's something that you want to bury. There's something that you want to say no more to. Because I believe we can do that. So we've come to our response time. And today again might be the day that you go over to the post-it notes and you write, no more shame. No more thinking I'm unworthy. You might think of someone who still comes in your head that hurt you and you want to write their name down and put them on the cross. It might be the day that you want to go light a candle for somebody who no, won't walk in the doors of a church because their shame has got a hold of them. Or you might even want to light a candle for the future self that you're going to have that will no longer be controlled by shame. We also have um, our communion, our time to take the body and the blood of Jesus to remember that he's resurrected and he's resurrected in you. Can I pray for you? Can we bow our heads? Father God, our, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed because we don't have to seek anymore. We don't have to look around anymore, Father, because we know that you are almighty. You are the God that saved us. You're the God that loved us enough that sent your son to die on the cross, be resurrected, so we can live a life of purpose here and for eternity with you, Father. Lord, I just pray if there's anyone here right now that's ready to say no more to shame, if they're ready to say no more, Lord, I just ask that, that they will signify that to you or they raise their hand right now or they just say that in their head, Lord, that, that they just take a second. I'm just going to ask people to raise their hands right now. If you, in this moment, if God's speaking, you raise your hand. No more shame. No more hold to be down. God has a purpose for me, and I will not say yes to shame. I will say yes to Jesus. Raise your hand right now if you're ready for that. Thank you, Father, for all the hands. Thank you, Lord, for the new life. Thank you, Father. That we're here to say yes to Jesus. Father God, I just continue to thank you for every heart, every mind that's here. May we walk away changed for the better, Lord, because you are a God of love. I pray that you give clarity of purpose, clarity of um, how to get rid of the past, and so that we can live and stand tall beside you, Lord that people will be so impressed of how we walk about this earth that people will say, what's different about you? And we at that point can say, I know a father who loves me enough to send a son to be crucified and resurrected. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all the hands that went up. Thank you for all the hearts that have been touched, Lord. And I thank you that because of your grace, I no longer have to listen to any voice but yours. We pray all these things 
In the name of Jesus, amen.